Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Masterpiece Virtual Roundtable. Um, my name is Anna, and I'm a digital associate producer here at Masterpiece. And today we have uh, the cast of Indian Summers. So um, without further ado, we have Aisha Kala, who plays Suni Dalal. Hello. We have Henry Lloyd Hughes, who plays Ralph Whelan, known on Google Hangout as Barry Chuckles. Yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it cut to Nick Ash's face? It's all right. It's it's better that way. <laughs> and we have Jemima West, who plays uh, Alice Whelan. Hello, everyone. And then we have Nikesh Patel, who plays Afrin Dalal. Hey, everyone. Um, all right. So we just wanted to take an opportunity to kind of look back at the series, which is unfortunately ending after season two, um, talk about the season two that we just saw on Masterpiece and the action-packed season finale, and um, just wanted a chance to catch up with the cast and really talk about their characters and where everyone has come. So I guess before we get into the nitty gritty, um, just to look back a little bit. So season one um, for Alice was really all about keeping the secret of um, her husband back in England, which in season two we found out why, <laughs> because he was a bit of a terror um, and made her life pretty horrible. And um, Ralph in season one, meanwhile, was all about getting uh, the job of Viceroy of India. And in season two, we saw that journey come to a kind of unfortunate end for him. Mm -hmm. um, Afrin went from loyalist to rebel to kind of everything in between and really kept us on the edge of our seats with all of these tangled alliances that he had to manage. And Sunni, um, who was always a little bit of a rebel and fighting for India's independence, had a whole new kind of challenge in season two when she had to manage her parents' expectation that she um, find a husband. So all of that drama, of course, was interlaced with action, tiger hunts, people spontaneously combusting, uh, indecent <laughs> proposals. What did you think when you first read season two? I mean, it was it just, it was insane. Um, yeah, I think the first time I read the first script, um, it starts at such a lick um, that it felt like, it felt like the same show and it felt really great to come back to these characters, but at the same time, it felt like a really deliberate step um, to you know, crank up the tension and and uh, and and do something really exciting um, and in a really interesting way, kind of it, it was a departure from the first series, so it was really exciting to and then and you know we 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 don't get all all of the scripts in one go, so you think you you think you know when you see the first I don't know first two or three, but. Yeah, uh, we had no idea. Basically. There's a lot. There's a lot of um, exclamation marks going, being sent to each other on the WhatsApp group when the latest batch of scripts would arrive because that's um, that's the way they kind of just get delivered on your doorstep when you're midway through making the show. So it's it's uh, it's like get, getting um, yeah, it's like be, it's like being a subscriber to a very surreal magazine. That is com going to completely uh, kind of uh, uh, dominate the next kind of couple of months of your life. And um, yeah, it's, it's bonkers because when every new bit would arrive, you'd be like, what? <laughs> um, but it was, you know, full of as many surprises for us as it was. That's, that's, one, that's one way in which the experience of being a viewer at home and us making it is kind of the same. It just happens a few months or years previously is like we're we're just as surprised and just as kind of like amazed and you know kudos to all the writers that worked on um the second series because there were so many um kind of eye-popping moments whether it was like yeah you know i remember the first time i read that indecent proposal scene with like the um you know the maharaja's uh well yeah the maharaja and the maharaja's wife of course and you know, just so many bonkers moments where I was like, oh my word, we're really um, taking this to the kind of outer limits of what people would be, would expect from, I guess, from a period um, drama, which must be interesting for your audience, Anna, I imagine. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it was um, definitely even a departure from season one, but I think um, different from a lot of the things that Masterpiece has done in the past. Was it different to film? Because I mean, there were, there must've been a lot more stunt people and even, I mean, animal wranglers or <laughs> exciting days on set. Yeah, the, the best thing about filming in Penang is that um, the animal wranglers quite often had nothing to do with filming the show. <laughs> it would just be, um, guys, you just need to take five because um, there's a pit viper in the cave where you're filming right now. So we've called someone to dispose of that. So that's there's definitely more unwanted animals on set than there were wanted animals on set. <laughs> yeah. What was the what was the scene where we had the where we had all those pugs in um in uh, uh, Dicky Bows? Yeah, that was season one. That was series one. Ep episode five or something with Rick and all the dogs. The very. Um, <laughs> I just remember like separate um, separate parts of costume being um, <laughs> subjugated into having to spruce the bow ties that were like three. No, like six pugs were wearing. <laughs> <laughs> they had their, their tailor-made costumes, didn't they? That's so funny. I just thought, you know, we were by the side of the road, getting in and out of like a, oh my God, were you in a horse-drawn carriage? And, um, and we had these um, six pugs all in um, tuxedos. Um, and there's not, you know, it's not, you don't get too many of those to the pound. <laughs> <laughs> in in uh, you know in, in other shows they definitely ran the full gamut of um, exotic experiences for us. <laughs> Sounds like it. All right, so I guess let's just get right into season two and um, specifically with your characters. So Nikesh, you really ran the gamut. I mean, Afrin in season one he was so kind of Hamlet-like and didn't really belong anywhere and was always like questioning his purpose and not really sure which side he should be on. Um, and then in season two, I mean, he kind of belonged everywhere. He went from um, being really loyal to the, to the crown, to the start of season two, being uh, part of the rebellion um, and the independence effort, and then moving on to kind of being a double agent and trying to help the people that he cared about on both sides. Um, and then in the end, really just giving up on everything and becoming kind of a nihilist. Um, can you tell us more about kind of what that journey was like and if there were any, if you think there were any big moments that really defined uh, that for Afrin? Wow, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, um, the Hamlet comparison isn't really one that I thought about before, but it kind of makes sense. I'd say his... his struggle to find his voice definitely continues in the second series. Um, and I think the, um, the fact that he was being pulled in all these different directions um, and his loyalties were really being tested is, is kind of what his, you know, what, what series, the second series in many ways is about for him. For me, it was um, really exciting to get to play um, those allegiances, allegiances, and how they shift, and um, yeah, it's uh, who who doesn't want to play a double agent? That's one of the that's one of the things that I really enjoyed. Um, you know, and, and Paul Rutman set that up at the start of the series. That <clears throat> as soon as you see Arthurin, he's a divided man in a lot of ways, and and I think as it goes on, you kind of realise that in many ways he doesn't know where he wants to go, and it, and it, it, that gets really affected by the very personal relationships he he has. And um, in terms of defining scenes, I think um, quite early on, uh, losing. Um, well, I think I uh, know that I think the first defining scene is, or the first defining moment is realizing when he gets back to um, Shimla at the at the start of the series. There's been a three year jump. Um, and so in many ways, he's come back to the people that he knows and loves. And, and it's, it, it's a very different dynamic to where he left to start with. You know, his family get the sense that he's this changed man because he's been working as a, as a, as a district officer because of kind of Ralph's ability to, to help fast track him at the end of the first series. Um, and that opens his eyes to this huge country that is India and uh, the injustices that get carried out and that are seen by 
the empire that he he believes can be a force for good and, and it really makes him question so um i think seeing the Whelans is really is really key um there's a the, the triangle of that relationship that was there in 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 the first series is, is very much there in the second um and seeing alice again because uh, that throws a massive spanner in the works he's he's he starts with this identity as a as a like you say as a rebel in many ways, um, sees Alice again in very quick succession. Uh, I'm presuming people who watch this will, you know, there's no need for spoiler alert, right? But oh, so yeah. he, yeah, <laughs> we're past he, that point. Hopefully. Yeah, we're way past that. So he loses um, Kyra Das really early at the hands of Naresh Banerjee. That that really kind of makes him realise that he's not a man of violence. Um, but yeah, I think I think those turning points are, are, are there throughout the the series, and and for me where at each point where he conflicts with someone that's really important to him is, is kind of, it helps define him. And then at the end, it's interesting that he goes, it's interesting that you say that he becomes a nihilist. And I think there's partly, there's a sense of going, well, one thing that he, one way that he is really sure he can be true to himself is following his heart and, and staying with Alice. And then it's what I thought was really interesting about the final episode when that seems to be, completely beyond hope because they found out that's the moment where he's able to go to go into the new private secretary's office and and tell him exactly what he feels so yeah it was um it was a real head spin to play in a really nice way to play that arc over 10 episodes and yeah i'm very grateful for it yeah and that was really i mean that final scene in the secretary's office was pretty intense it was like afrin takes the stand and um he kind of I think in a way he said a lot of the things that the viewers who sympathize with the independence movement from the beginning had been thinking is just, you know, that. And probably, you know, a lot of viewers were, were waiting for Alfred to say for the whole series, you know, and, and I, and myself included, I think when, so when, when I got that, um, when I saw that part in, in of the script in episode 10, it was like having a, it was like having a monologue from a play. Um, you know, it's, it's quite rare to have something like that um, in, in TV where the, you know, the exchanges tend to be shorter because scenes are shorter. So, yeah, it was, it was really exciting that that came from Afrin at his lowest. And then, you know, the next thing he's, he's driving out with, with Ralph to uh, try and rescue Alice from a mob. Yeah, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That was definitely the reference point in that rickety old car when we were driving. Well, as you said too, the um, as you alluded to earlier, I think his relationship with Alice has always been kind of this constant thread throughout, no mm. matter which phase of his life or beliefs he's in. Um, is there something about their relationship or their the why they're attracted to each other that you think can kind of transcend all of that? I think it was interesting. For Jemima and I talked a lot about this, but it's interesting how um, it, it, it seemed to evolve from the first series, where you know it felt like it felt like young love, and and it felt you know uh, it started from this mad coincidence of of them being at the club that that fateful night when when um, uh, Chandu Mohan tried to shoot Ralph, and but then from there on it it, it, it there was a there was definitely more of a a sadness to them reconnecting in the second series um and that that first scene where they where they meet again at the club i, I still really vividly remember um because it was such a it was so well written and it was such a joy to, to play it with with jemima but i think um yeah i think maybe what what draws them to each other is in in so many ways despite all the obstacles that are placed on them um you know they have to meet in secret and the one person that they're both incredibly they have they're both incredibly close to who is ralph if he found out would as we well we see him do um completely flip his lid but i think what draws them to each other is the fact that they can be really true to each other in a in a strange way um that they can't be with with others that are really close to them including their own family oh yeah that's interesting um, so we have a quick fan question, which is from uh, yes, Sierra on Facebook, who asked, would Afrin's parents have accepted a marriage between Afrin and Alice? 
Um, well, it's interesting because, you know, they, <laughs> I see you're shaking your head, um, because they didn't accept um, uh, Khan and Sunni um, at the end of uh, episode 10. Although the fact that um, uh, Darius turns up in, in secret, I think, uh, speaks volumes. I'm an optimist. So I think, well, I think two things are true. I think our friends are at a point by the end where it doesn't really matter that they accept it. And I think it would be obviously really important to him that they did. Um, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm going to say it might take years, but that they would, they would come around to it. Someday. Good. All right. So uh, that really is a good segue into Jemima on Alice. Um, and Alice was someone who from the beginning, you know, she's the first person that we meet in this show. She's on the train. Uh, we don't know anything about her. And it's very, it's very much a slow burn of learning her secret that she does have a husband back in England. Um, and then in season two, she's still struggling with a secret and that's um, her secret relationship with Afrin. And then kind of trying to keep her, the extent of her relationship with Charlie under wraps because I think um, it's a little, I don't, I'm not sure if she finds it embarrassing or just um, just kind of a difficult thing to handle. But so what is it that, I mean, she finally breaks free from that secrecy in the finale, albeit in a really violent <laughs> culmination of all of this uh, drama. But what do you think that journey was like for her and, and what kind of caused her in the end to just snap and, and say that was enough? Well, I think the first time we meet Alice on the train, as you say, we meet this young woman full of, hiding her secrets on her way to India. And I think from the start, Alice is in a quest for freedom. And when we find her, even though three years have passed and even though the situation has evolved and her husband is back, um, the, the reason why she is hiding the fact that uh, is because she's lied about him in the past. So she can't really come back and say, oh, by the way, I'm not a widow. This is my husband. So, so that's all the secret there is that she can't say he is the father of my son. Um, he is threatening us, etc., etc." But um, I think when we find Alice again in series two, it's the same thing. I mean, she is obviously in a tricky situation and has to protect herself and her son and she doesn't want to leave India and her family and her brother. But um, ultimately it's, it's still the same thing of looking for that freedom and, and as the series progresses and the lid becomes sort of tighter and tighter on her and her life and associated with her seeing Afrin more and more and her strong desire for him and what she initially came to India for progresses that's when it all sort of shatters and she can't handle it anymore so the, the the freedom that she finally seems to get at the end of series two is actually what she's been looking for since the beginning I think. Oh, that's interesting yeah um and so of course that pressure that we uh, that you talk about is coming from her husband charlie who was played by blake ritson who i think we got a lot of viewer comments at wondering what it was like to film with him and what those scenes were like because he really was just kind of a terrifying presence and could like in every scene would just make your skin crawl when you were watching He's it much worse off camera than he is on camera exactly that's the thing is that meet him in real life <laughs> He's, I think Blake's, Blake's the first person in the world to say the Lord of Misrule. The paradox about Blake Ritson is that he is just people on earth. And I think that's also why he blended in so well with the cast it, when he joined us for second series. He's just, he's great. He's, we worked really hard at making that, um, that relationship very claustrophobic and tense on screen. And he really committed um, a lot to his craft and he was amazing to watch and and very sweet and apologetic at the end of every sort of traumatic scene but i mean in between takes it was just banter and jokes all around great guy lots of fun so yeah i think that's that we found that good balance of fun times and and hard work and it was amazing it's weird to say, it's always really weird to say it was amazing acting with Blake and acting out all these really gritty scenes. But as actors, they're, I think they're the scenes that really challenge us and make us want to go further. And when you have a partner 
opposite you who's giving you so much, all you want to do is give him back and sort of build that tension. And as it progressed, we were lucky enough that we had so many scenes we could go even further with. Um, so it was a delight. That's great. That's good to hear that he wasn't like his on-screen character, I suppose. Um, so we did have a fan question from Stacy, who asked, the series ended on such a high note, but where do you think Alice and Afrin were headed to in the future? Would Afrin have pursued more political plans or kept their relationship safe, considering all that they'd faced to be happy in the end? Well, uh, I wish they could have a peaceful... Uh, settled married life with Alice's child and maybe children of their own. But knowing Paul Rutman and uh, his writing, I think he would have faced our characters with quite a few challenges. I, I would hope that they would stay together and, and lead a, a more steady life. But I think what I would have liked to see probably is them having not only Afrin, but also Alice engage in a more political role and have them have them do that together, I guess. But who knows? Yeah, would have been interesting. Uh, Nikesh, do you think Afrin would have given up on politics? Is he kind of done with that game, or is it, is it just there's something that he would bring him back? Well, there's 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 two things to bear in mind. There's there's what we'd like as sort of normal human beings, and then what Paul Rutman would write as an evil genius. Um, I think. I think Afrin's uh, politics are definitely not not done, and and I think what would be interesting in this kind of brave new world where he kind of boldly um, professes his love to to Alice is that actually we know that would probably be un placed under incredible pressure. Um, so yeah, look, um, I, I imagine um, were we to see how it played out, there'd be uh, lots more juicy conflict. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so we have a little game to break things up a little bit. We'll start with you, Aisha, and we'll just go down the line. So uh, this is a game called Would You Rather, and you've probably played it before, but this is uh, using scenarios from the show or uh, scenarios that could happen in the show. So would you rather become Viceroy of India, a lot of pressure, or... Would I rather the first one? Oh, would you rather become Viceroy of India oh, right. or owner of the Simla Club? Oh, definitely owner of the Simla Club. It's a bit less pressure, I think. <laughs> I think you get more juicy gossip out of that one. Anybody else? It's hard to prize. It's hard to prize Aisha from a club anyway. So I yeah, know. I think, for sure. I think we all knew the answer to that one. Pick the right person. Juicy gossip and parties. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So good. Anybody else? Does anybody want to be the new Cynthia? Oh, do we all have to answer? Well, you don't have to, but <laughs> if you if you have an opinion. Listen, if Aisha was managing the club, I mean, I would love to go there. Any club that yeah. she was in charge of, I'd love to go there. <laughs> But I'd be letting Ralph down if I didn't say that I, I would, you know, grasp the opportunity to be Viceroy with, with both hands. We'd be the dream team, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, if, I, if they let me be Viceroy, your club will be no holds barred. The lic any licensing, you know, kind of infractions would be, I'd turn yes. a blind eye to. Sonny and Ralph, take over. <laughs> that sounds terrifying. <laughs> Series three, the club years. Yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what your problem is. <clears throat> All right, so the next scenario, we have would you rather permanently wear Cynthia's dove turban from season two or Shamsha Dalal's glasses, eyeglasses from season one? Definitely Shamsha's glasses. Definitely Shamsha's glasses. Definitely the glasses. He is too cute with those glasses on. That dove thing must be really heavy as well. We used to yeah, joke that they were. Yeah, yeah. We used to joke um, with with Ashna that they that they were her Harry Potter glasses, which she found hilarious. She was really into that, but also her character with those glasses definitely deserved its own spin-off. We were thinking, I was thinking like oh, yeah. that sassy yeah. Clarissa explains it all um, show. 
Uh, we had it all mapped out. What, 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 we, what did they call it? Shamshad, uh, like, leave it to Shamshad. Yeah, leave it to Shamshad. <laughs> That's so good. Kind of sassy, Clarissa explains it all type character. And there was a sidekick, wasn't there? Who was the sidekick? I it was remember. Anan. No, that, that, um, who was the guy in series one that was with Afrin when he was drawing that picture? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Wasn't it your, him? Your buddy from the ICS. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Good old Anand, yeah. Great lad, great lad. Anyway, Anna, we had plans. We had plans for Shamshad and her glasses. <laughs> yeah, so clearly nobody wants to wear the dove turban. It's, not, it's getting a, th a flat thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> little too little too heavy, a little too complicated. All I right, just so, remember from Julie yeah, wearing it, but it was all the heavy. Way. <laughs> it was very heavy. So there's one left, and this is a doozy. Um, would you rather go on a tiger hunt with the Maharaja dangerous or go on a date with charlie <laughs> definitely. Oh, oh. definitely i'd rather go on, go on the date with charlie and stab him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> listen i i'm the one person that's actually been on a tiger hunt with the maharaja and you know aside from him trying to have sex with my sister it was a pretty chill time <laughs> yeah i think and i'd trying, rather and using a I'd boy rather a tiger i'm trying to come to a tree i think yes Nikesh, are you going on a date with a tiger? Is that what you said? I'd rather date the tiger than date Charlie. Um, yeah, I think that's that's one of the yeah that's one of the last things anyone should want. Oh my god! <laughs> All right, so uh, back to the characters. Aisha, if we could talk about Suni, um, she was really a fan favorite character for us from the beginning. I think a lot of our viewers loved she was so independent and so outspoken and kind of the opposite of Afrin in season one, who was trying to figure everything out. And she was like, nope, this is how it is. Um, yeah. And in season two, so season one, she was really finding her purpose and finding, trying to find her place in the society that was limiting her based on her ambitions. And um, season two was a whole different ball game when she had to um, approach the marriage question with her parents. Um, and then it turned out, of course, that she had the three options, Mr. Khan, Ian, uh, the plantation owner, and then the uh, Mr. Uh, Bauman, the man with the unnecessary eyebrows that her parents wanted her to marry. <laughs> so what do you think each suitor offered her and why in the end did she decide to, to go with Mr. Khan? Say that again. <laughs> Um, what do you think each suitor offered her, and why do you think she decided in the end to go with Mr. Khan? Um, I think they all definitely had their pluses. I mean, the eyebrows, definitely up there on the list. But he <laughs> offered her something right at the end, just before she went off with Mr. Khan. He offered her a life where she could live behind the scenes and pretend to be, you know, a traditional wife but that she could be a lawyer behind the scenes with him um and i think that was slightly tempting because i think that was the first time she came close to being able to really work as a lawyer because it's quite it was tough then for that to happen for a woman um i think with ian she loved him dearly and that was the one that i kept saying to paul why isn't she marrying Ian? Why isn't this happening? And he, he, he described it in a couple of ways. One is that she never saw Ian like that. She, it was always a friendship and she saw him as almost a kindred spirit eventually. Um, and another thing was that deep down, Sunny was quite traditional. And I think even she would have found it hard to have married this Scottish man that, you know, their, their traditions were so different. And so when it came to Khan, he was really a match of the brains, really. And he sort of um, could outwit her almost. I mean, no one can outwit her, but he could rival her and, and challenge her. And so that was really why she went with him in the end. So that, of course, uh, the Mr. Khan marriage caused a big problem with her family um, because he was a Muslim and she um, was Parsi. And that mm -hmm. scene uh, where they 
the family where her family kind of confronted her and was expecting her to marry the eyebrow man was so heartbreaking. Um, and we really got to see the a kind of a different side of her, I think, when she expressed how angry she was at Afrin and kind of blaming him for, um, well, either blaming him or just expressing her anger that he could kind of do whatever he wanted. And as a man, he got the, and as the um, older brother, he got the privilege. It's not uh, the first time she's been yeah. angry with Afrin, though. I'm just going to jump in there. That's, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the things I love about the relationship is that she will constantly let him have it. That's true. Yeah, she's always been a very outspoken critic of Afrin. <laughs> um, but so it, in the end for her, even though we were so happy that she got kind of this fairy tale ending in a way, it was bittersweet because we didn't get um, her parents buy in. Can you um, talk more about kind of the struggle that she faced with her parents' acceptance of it? Yeah, um, it's. I guess it's rooted in the in the Parsi community because they don't they don't ever marry out. So if you're a Parsi, you can only ever marry a Parsi, and nobody else can convert to being a Parsi. So it's not a thing of the community can expand. It's just, that's it. You marry within the community. Um, and it's, I mean, still now that's how the parties are. So I can imagine in 1930 that that would have been just so heart wrenching for her family. And it says a lot about her that she is this pioneer and she, she, she saw the difference in, in their traditions, obviously, but she also wanted to follow her heart and she wanted to be able to have the choice herself and not to be kept telling people telling her what she had to do. And I love that Paul wrote that in there because it's so important even now to show female role models like that, I think, um, especially in the Asian community. And like you said about her sticking, up, um, sticking it to Afrin all the time, I think still now there's a there's quite a big thing about you know boys are, are kind of praised a lot in that community and it's great that she sort of could go it's not right that he gets to do whatever he wants and especially because he was running off and um being in love how doing what he wanted to do and she was jealous and he said it so yeah yeah, it was great. It was a really cathartic scene. Very sad. Um, so yeah. we had a fan question for you from Dino, which you kind of already answered, but if you have anything else, um, and you can see how the fans feel, they feel very strongly. So she said, why not Mr. Ian? I confess I'm a sucker for a friendship turning into war, and they definitely built a strong friendship. I know, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Poor Mr. Ian. I mean, that was the most heartbreaking thing of all. Um, having to let him down um I don't know if I could go back I'd choose Mr Ian <laughs> <laughs> a little gratification for them all right so Henry uh you are last but not least this was a huge season for Ralph um we've been with him from the beginning on this journey and he really like there was no line that he wouldn't cross and he sacrificed so many things and um and I think in the end when it all fell apart even though there were certainly moments when you disagreed with him or were mad at him. You kind of couldn't help but feel bad for him because he really lost everything that he had been looking for for so long. Um, do you think him not getting that position was entirely out of his control and was a either a, a family, you know, a breeding thing, or um, was there something he could have done? Did his pride get in the way? Was it at all up to him? I think it was the perfect storm of all those um, all those elements rotating round him. I mean, I did say to Paul Rutman, the writer, at various points throughout the making, and also, you know, at that stage when you're just reading these episodes, being like, "Are you trying to kill me?" And when I say me, I meant like, "Are you trying to kill me, Henry?" But are you also, you know, are you trying to kill Ralph? Because there's no uh, element that you're not. Um, basically causing, you know, causing to uh, be traumatic or kind of intense crisis in his life on all fronts. 
and taking the domestic, upsetting that and, and interweaving it with the political. And so, and then of course, his very, very close uh, protective relationship that he has with his sister is also crumbling because she's he's at the behest because he has the financial debt with Charlie. So it's like, he's just in this prison of all these elements. Um, and I think it was all, I think it was all that stuff. Um, ultimately one of the things that was, it's emblematic of that period of time that it was important to be seen as respectable and, and particularly in the world of politics, maybe not so in the world in the 21st century. Um, but be, to be thought of as steady. I think the combination of the whispers about his finances or whatever, and there was just too many things that had gone against him in, in terms of him, as well as his breeding, which he was always going to have to work against. Um, he was seen as being unsteady. And, you know, you could argue that there's a good case for that because he's, he's approaching almost total meltdown in, in the second series. And it felt very arduous uh, to to take him through that journey and often felt like I was having a meltdown of my own uh, in the making of. Um, but, you know, I I was incredibly grateful, I suppose, for um, for the writers uh, for for. For, for you know for notching it up across the board and and in if you know in many ways i think of that the journey that all the characters have been on and i'm, I'm aware that this is possibly one of the last opportunities that we'll get to talk about this show so you know for the avoidance of doubt i loved the experience of working with you know these three guys here and or getting a chance to say the lines that were written for me by Paul Ruttman and the, the, the other writers that appeared on the show. And it was an absolutely tremendous uh, experience and one that I was incredibly honored to play a part in. Well, as you said, he did, I mean, it was moving towards a meltdown and then he kind of had it um, as, you know, then turning in his resignation and riding off into the sunset, as we said with Afrin. Mm. Um, now that the, you know, the dream is kind of dead. If there had been a season three, where do you think he would have gone from here? Yeah, I think the thing that we were trying to aim for thematically with that, from, from conversations I had with Paul, was something that really felt like gut-wrenching to have that dream die. And yet, a kind of out of that bitterness, a sweet relief of some sorts. And it and it and it and it was like uh you know like an apocalypse where everything that you've worked for gets decimated and then out of the rubble you see a f some kind of new dream appearing some kind of flower so for me dramatically it would be most interesting if he went off in a new um avenue you know for me i would i would love to see a series in which he wasn't um you know, back to the drawing board on a, uh, in a, in a kind of political angle and working in another sphere or doing something, maybe succeeding, maybe failing, but trying something new because it felt like in order to, in order to warrant that being important and that and all the brain power that had gone into that, those decisions, um, if it, when it all goes down the plug hole, in order for that pain to feel real, it's almost like he has to start again. I mean, I, I, you know, I thought it was, I, I couldn't see them, be, I couldn't see them being in the house. I couldn't see them being in Chotipo. I couldn't, I, I, it, it seemed like whatever was going to happen next had to be a departure from the status quo. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I thought, um, you know, if, if there was to be another series um, and who's saying that, that they're not, there might not be at some point, um, everything is is wide open in terms of what you can do and where you can take the characters. So this might be related to that actually. Your your fan question um, came from Courtney on Facebook who said, who, or who asked, Ralph decided to come totally clean with the Viceroy, the, the previous Viceroy Willington, about Jaya and Adam. What made him decide to do that? Do you think it was based in that kind of desire to just like be done and start fresh? Yeah, I think we we spoke with the writer uh, with you know about just about like then he's then he wants to blow up his entire life, 
It's like, well, if my house is going to fall down, I might as well rig the foundations with TNT and press the plunger. Funnily enough, the scene in which I'm telling the Viceroy that stuff, in the script, it just had like a couple of lines. And then it said, and the band plays, and we cut to the band playing. You and improvised it. improvised it for... To, to make the scene work for Patrick, who I was in the scene with. So I was kind of just coming up with stuff like he's, you know, like he's let the lid off and he's just, you know, this stuff is coming out. And then when I watched the show in the edit, I was, when we were doing the ADR, I was like, oh man, they've kept it in. I was a little bit embarrassed. I would have, <laughs> I would have written it slightly better or put a bit more, but I mean, it, it holds up. I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's fine. It's interesting because it's actually, obviously it's a key moment and it's a denouement, but I, I thought they were going to stick to the script and, and just kind of cut it, you know, and just have the wide of the band playing whilst I kind of went off in the Viceroy's ear. Um, but instead, uh, they got some of my words, you know, that I lied and I lied again and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I, you know, I think he wants to, he wants to make sure it's dead. He wants to... It's, it's a fully, then it's just about like exercising the demons almost. Do you see what I mean? Like I've had this in my head. It's been the, the specter at the feast. I mean, in the case of Jaya's ghost, quite literally, <laughs> um, let, you know, let me get, let me get this out of me. And hopefully the episode and adventure in the car should feel like a slightly different Ralph is being birthed. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, speaking of fresh starts, obviously, unfortunately, the series is ending with season two, um, which I know a lot of our viewers are upset about. But um, so you, we don't know what's next for everyone. But um, if you could give your character kind of a next chapter, what what would be in it, I guess? Forever, forever, for, for Aisha, too. Oh, yeah. OK. Aisha, do you want to start? Um, oh, it's quite hard. I think it'd be really interesting if we were, if we were, would have been allowed to go up to partition. Um, because obviously Sunni would be Muslim now, and um, partition involved the, a big separation of the Muslim community, Hindu community, Parsi community, and so she would have been completely separated from her family by then. Um, and, and there would have been a, a lot of emotion and a lot of anger, I think. Um, I think that would have been really exciting to be able to play with and explore. Um, but leading up to that, probably, you know, a happily married life with Khan. Um, Nikesh used to joke, joke that they'd put me in a fat suit and I'd, I'd be pregnant. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would have hoped that she'd become a lawyer and have, have been able to explore that and, and really make a difference somehow, because I think that's all she wanted to do. Henry, what about you? How would that fresh start look? Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of leading on from what I was saying before, I think um, I think he'd like to pl enter into a new phase. I, I don't necessarily think that he would be in Simla. I don't even can't even guarantee that he would be in this, you know, in the same line of work, or maybe even in a different country uh, to try and really um, feel like he had left the kind of that life behind and was starting completely afresh. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't like to think of him as being ruined. I'd like to think of him as actually feeling like a very different character. If he was going to come back, I think he would feel like a, like, a, like a reformed man or a transformed man in some sort of ways. N not necessarily pure as the driven snow, <laughs> but, but uh, definitely... Um, shaped in a new way, I think. And Jemima and Nikesh, you, your next chapter would probably be together, but... <laughs> we hope, yeah. Um, I, I think what would have been interesting for, for the show would have been, as Aisha was saying, to go up to partition and to, to see the characters age. There's something delightful in going from one series to the next and adding three years on, three years on, three years on, and being... I would have loved to be younger than the character I was portraying and sort of see that evolve. Um, but for Alice and Afrin, obviously 
being together and probably having children and seeing and exploring that the, the question of integration with children um and yeah and for alice more personally i think something more political um a more independent role because in series two she was very dependent on men and i think it would have been nice to see her go somewhere more independently politically something like that yeah yeah i think for for offering the the yeah, i would have loved to see there's so many I, I suppose one of the most um uh the, the the things I'll miss about uh, about being part of this is is there's it's a chance to tell so many stories from this period and shine a light on so many things that we didn't know about or, or, or don't get talked about, like the fact that you know uh, India's involvement in the Second World War um, is really interesting, and and politically uh, you have people within India kind of realizing that there is. The, the demands that the war places on on the British Empire mean that actually now is the time to really try and um, shake off the yoke. Uh, and, and I think dramatising that would have been really interesting and in whether uh, I imagine someone like Afrin would again be with where he sort of wakes up politically at the end of the second series. Would that mean he was at the forefront of that movement? Um, or would he be, you know down in the trenches with with Ian um, fighting against the 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 Axis powers in in Burma I, I, I don't know but um, and then how all of that would compact um, with with trying to carve out this very precarious um, life with Alice because I don't think despite uh, realizing that they are together at the end of the second series I don't think it's something that would be uh, that would get easier. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, as we prepare to say goodbye and wrap up, did you have yeah. anything that you wanted to say to fans of the of the series? Thanks. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just thank you for thank you for your your support. I've, I've sort of um, seen some of what people have have been um, saying uh, online in response as the show's gone out, and it's it's great that it's kind of captured you guys and, and um, as, as much as, as much as it did us when, when we were making it. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't choose Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I second that. And I, I think um, it's something that, uh, as I said before, very proud of and, you know, uh, tells a, or we, we were starting to go some way to shine a light on loads of parts of um, uh, really, really interesting, rich parts of um, history uh, that haven't been mined and haven't been explored uh, in anywhere near as much um, depth as they should have done. And obviously I speak for all of us when I say that we were, we, you know, we, we feel like we haven't gone uh, to, to the full length that we should have done because we wanted to get to partition and that was the kind of dream. Um, but we're very, very um, proud of the stories that we've told up to this point and just glad that they're out there and, and hope that people will continue to enjoy them. Well, thank you very much, everybody. This has been great. Um, and we're sure that you know, we'll see you all again in a, another Masterpiece production. This won't be <laughs> goodbye forever, just goodbye for now. Let's um, hope so. so in the meantime, obviously, viewers, you can see a select episodes of Indian Summers online at pbs.org slash masterpiece. And um, we hope that we will see you soon on another uh, Masterpiece production cast. Thank you so much. Um, and it's been great. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody.